And throughout its 130 year history, all this electricity that's been used ever has been sourced from coal power. Until last year, when 120 kilowatts of solar panels were installed on the school's roof at no cost to the school whatsoever. All the school needs to do is pay for using the solar panels at a price which is about 20% lower cost than buying electricity from City Power, who is their local utility. Um, what's more, they don't need to pay for any insurance costs, maintenance costs or management. They just get lower cost, clean energy for the next 25 years. The children in this school are now growing up, seeing their education be powered by clean energy. Many of these children are going to go and start businesses of their own and they're going to put solar panels on the roofs of those businesses because they know that solar power works. And some of the children in this school even own some of the solar panels powering their own education and earning income from those solar panels. So what is going on here? And you know, let's just ask a couple more questions. It, did, a, did a magical solar panel fairy just come down one day and put these solar panels on their roof like some of the eco Santa Claus? Or has ESCOM just started to decide to give out free solar panels to be nice? Well, before we answer those questions, let's just give some, some wider context. So South Africa has got some of the best solar radiation in the world. It's totally blessed with one of the highest solar yields. In fact, the solar yield in South Africa is almost double that, in fact, more than double that of the UK, where I'm from, hence why I set up a business in solar energy in this country. Um, and not only that, but because this country's energy mix is so carbon heavy, so carbon intensive, because it's mainly sourced from coal power, a solar panel installed here in South Africa offsets four times the carbon emissions than it would do installed in the UK. And if Denmark is going to be 0% carbon, that's infinite more uh, carbon savings if you put a solar panel here, if you've got a carbon neutral grid. Um, so that's on, a, on an energy level. And on the carbon level, and in fact just pollution, I mean, the Puma, and Pumalanga where the electricity that's being used by this building right now is being produced, the air quality in that area is the second worst in the world. Second to only some really quite grim uh, metal smelting plants in Russia. Uh, and this is mainly sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, and CO2. Now, nitrous oxide, we've heard of methane earlier today, but nitrous oxide is 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And that is a very, very powerful greenhouse gas. But on the CO2 side, I mean, we, we may well be aware that carbon dioxide now is at the same level it was 3.5 million years ago when the sea levels were 120 metres higher than they are today. And CO2, and talking, talking of oceans, CO2 reduces, causes ocean acidification. It reduces the amount of carbonate in the water, which affects how marine organisms can grow and is killing coral reefs. And coral reefs are the nurseries for many of the world fisheries. But you know, some of these impacts are decades away, and I don't even like eating fish, so why should I care? Well, a study was done on, the 14, uh, on 14 coal power stations in Mbumalanga, and it was identified that between 305 to 650 women and children died prematurely in Mbumalanga alone in the year 2016. These are brothers, mothers, children dying purely because they live close to these coal power stations. So can we all agree that shutting down these power stations is a good idea for the environment? But then, what about, you say, of the 82,000 people employed in the coal sector? People like Vincent here. Now, Vincent works in the informal coal sector. He goes and finds abandoned coal mines that litter the Mpumalanga countryside in search for a livelihood. Now, last year, he was caught in a rockfall when his leg was very badly injured. But despite his injury, him and many others have to continue working in horrific conditions because it's the only livelihood available. Well, good news for Vincent, because there's loads of jobs on their way. And what's even better for, for Vincent is he doesn't need to leave his hometown to get those jobs because solar panels need to be installed where he lives. In fact, solar panels are going to be installed over the whole country because solar energy is available everywhere, not just in the isolated coal fields of one particular area of this country. And what's more, despite the coal industry is already suffering job losses, job we started suffering job losses because it's becoming increasingly automated with bigger machines scraping the land for coal. 
Solar panels have to be installed by hand. No robot yet exists, at least in the, in the next five decades, that has the manual dexterity to install, and po so install solar panels. This is an entirely manual process. So this is going to create jobs. How many jobs? Well, when you look at how many um, jobs are created on a per unit of electricity basis, so comparing 100 terawatt hours of electricity production from coal to 100 terawatt hours of solar electricity, you're going to create 38% more jobs. And this is just the direct jobs. This is the installing jobs and the electricians. This is ignoring the fact that because anybody can get into solar installing, this is going to be a boom for SMEs. So now we're looking at haulage, we're looking at guest houses, we're looking at accountants, we're looking at marketing, we're looking at telemarketing, we're looking at TEDx presenters. <laughs> you know, the point is, is that this job boom is happening. So now we can identify that abandoning coal is good for the environment and good for society. So who's going to pay for all of this? Can we go to the central government who control and decide on where energy money is, energy money is being spent? Well, considering they're pretty heavily invested into the coal industry already and they've got pretty big coal power stations already constru under construction, we can probably say that's a safe bet that the answer is going to be no. But what about the global community? What about the $7 trillion that's been pledged into clean energy? How do we move that money here? What about the global citizens sitting around wanting to do something, investing into solar? Well, wouldn't it be cool if there was some kind of transnational, borderless, peer-to-peer -peer payment system that was practically free to use that enabled global micro-level energy transactions? Well, in 2009, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he, she, or they are, laid down the genesis block of the Bitcoin blockchain. And in that blockchain, the first ever record, there was an excerpt from the Financial Times on that day from January the 3rd, 2009, that simply read, Chancellor Alistair Darling on brink of second bailout for banks. Now, that message was left in that blockchain as a very deliberate reminder that that system was being set up as an alternative to a centralised financial system to a decentralised financial system. Just as with solar panels, there's a decentralised energy system uh, emerging from a centralised energy system. And this is a cashless, digital, peer-to-peer -peer payment system that anybody on Earth can use. And in fact, it's so easy to use, it's permissionless, that you can now send a tenth of a million dollars, uh, sorry, a tenth of a million cents of a dollar to millions of dollars in ten minutes from one person to another person and back anywhere in the world. Now, put into practice, this means that someone sat in an apartment in London can now earn in real time money that's being produced from a solar panel located on the other side of the planet. We can now convert photons into electrons into data. We can stream monetized sunshine into your mobile phone's digital wallet. And therefore, platforms and sharing economy, these kind of things, platforms like the Sun Exchange, enable individuals to own solar panels located remotely. Now, owning solar panels is a really good idea, because if you own a solar panel, especially when it's installed somewhere like South Africa, you're going to get between a 10 and 15% return on the energy that's being produced. And that is why 304 individuals from 35 countries around the world and how they were able to buy solar panels in this project that are now being used by the school, giving them immediate access to low-cost energy and giving both an environmental, social and economic return to the owners of those solar panels. What's more, because of the microtransaction nature of using things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, the entry price now to becoming a solar power producer is less than $5. It used to cost $10,000 to put solar panels on the roof of your own home, which basically meant that solar power was something reserved for the upper middle class. Now solar energy production is available to everybody. So what does this mean? Where is this going? Well, when we look at things of where we are now, we're coming from a world of centralised money, which is basically infinite. I mean, a central bank can just print out money and it devalues the money we're using. Look at Zimbabwe for an extreme example. That's infinite money and finite energy. You know, you've got a finite resource of energy and it's causing environmental destruction and the more people require energy, you've got a um, scarce resource, you're in a world of scarcity, energy prices are going to continue to increase. And then we transition to a world of decentralised, finite money, i.e. things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, which are a fixed supply, they cannot be increased. 
So it increases, the value of that money increases over time. And then use that to buy and spend and invest in infinite energy, solar, that's abundant. It becomes cheaper over time the more people use it. So you've exited the world of scarcity into a world of abundance. And we've already passed that threshold. 2009 is when these technologies merge and manifest in platforms like the Sun Exchange. But if this sounds fanciful, just consider this. 115 years ago, the Wright brothers took off in the first powered aircraft. It was made out of giant spruce, and it was paid for probably out of metal coins and paper money. Now, 115 years later, there's a hundred, sorry, there is a million people in the sky at any one time. On their mobile phones, devices that didn't even exist 20 years ago, surfing the internet, watching blockbuster movies. I'm not advertising Emirates here. I'm just saying you can eat, you can drink curry, uh, eat curry and drink beer on an aircraft. Now, as, as a footnote, my, my life aspiration is to actually li have a solar-powered liveaboard blimp, but they don't exist, so I couldn't put a photo of it as the next stage. But my point is, is that by us as consumers spending our money in certain industries to unlock the value and utility of things like, for example, the aviation industry, it means we can unlock new potential. So you can be on the right side of history, and you can participate in building this new clean energy-based economy, one based on solar panels and silicon chips, and then we can provide sustainable energy for all. And then more businesses, organisations and schools like Sacred Heart College can go solar at no cost, and we as individuals can make money from sunshine. Thank you.